Hi, I'm Lauren Thomas. In this video, we're going to talk about the philosophical origins of the concepts we call health and well being. The learning objectives of this video lecture is for you to identify ancient and modern philosophies that have influenced our institutional and cultural understanding of health and well being, as well as um, you know, a recognition of the philosophical beliefs that have influenced your own perceptions of health and well being. So East Asia is home to the world's oldest civilizations. And we know that traditional Chinese medicine techniques were developed around a philosophy we now label as Taoism. Um, these techniques uh, include acupuncture, Tai Chi, herbal medicine. So these are um, techniques that have been in a part of human history for thousands of years. Um, Ayurveda is a holistic system of medicine that was developed in India, also uh, in sort of the 5,000, 3,000 uh, BC time period. And what we, we consider uh, it as the world's oldest system of natural medicine, that uh, it integrates therapies such as yoga, massage, meditation, and herbal remedies. Um, so these uh, ideas have been with us for a long time. The idea of a, uh, a centering, a mind-body connection. In around 1500 BC, um, the book of Leviticus uh, is believed to be the first written health code, um, a, a written uh, document of laws that provide guidance around hygiene, um, sexual health behaviors, and protecting against uh, contagious infectious diseases in a community um, setting. Also, the Code of Hammurabi uh, was created by the King of Babylon, which includes um, you know, codes of conduct for both physicians and their ways of practicing. Hippocrates, uh, in the you know, 400 BC era, uh, was what we consider now the father of Western medicine. Um, he was an ancient, an ancient Greek philosopher. Um, he had several um, quotes that we still consider today when we think about um, our beliefs about health and well-being. Um, he's credited with the, the quote of, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Uh, and walking is man's best medicine. Um, he also uh, believed that there were natural forces within us that are the true healers of disease and illness. Um, and he also has a quote of that it's more important for us to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. All very interesting thoughts um, and beliefs about um, the illnesses within us, um, where it um, lies and what we can do to provide healing and treatment for ourselves. Um, Hippocrates also uh, uh, was later credited uh, with an influential um, ethical um, sort of belief system that we now call the Hippocratic Oath. And it's uh, something that modern medical students still today take the Hippocratic Oath as a part of their entering into medical practice um, that establishes um, you know, a, a, an ethical framework for um, providing health care to patients. Other Greek philosophers like Aristippus and Epicurus uh, developed uh, philosophies around understanding the role of pleasure. Um, the you know the Greek philosopher Aristippus he aimed to live a life where he was all about maximum pleasure and minimizing pain, um, and what we now call hedonism, um, which focuses on you know really feeling good uh, and that feel good aspect of happiness that sort of um, somatic feeling within ourselves that um, comes when we have the rush of what we now would call dopamine or, or um, you know, uh, you know these bonding uh, feelings that we have, um, or you know, uh, what the unfortunate thing is is that uh, Aristippus really laid into this. He really lived a life in pursuit of pleasure alone, 
uh, and he did anything for the sake of particularly sensual pleasure. Um, he slept with many women, he enjoyed fine food and wine, and he really could care less about um, the social standards of, of the Greek civilization at the time. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, what we would, what we would call now casual sex, a lack of monogamy, um, a lot of consumerism. Um, if someone who is now following this type of philosophy, this kind of way of being, they may be um, participating in excessive alcohol or drug use, indulgent eating. Um, uh, so, so it's an interesting way of living. Um, that's uh, uh, what, uh, again, the philosopher Aristippus really wanted to pursue pleasure alone, particularly sensual pleasure. Epicurus also um, saw the role of pleasure being an important role when it comes to um, having a good life. Um, he still saw uh, pleasure as something that was supremely good, uh, but he interpreted it through, you know, a lens of prudence and, you know, fine uh, living, um, high uh, society of sorts, um, which uh, I think the even the term Epicurious is linked with fine dining still. Um, I bring this, this particular photo um, out, which is from a show called Parks and Rec. Um, we often, even today, st use the terms, hey, treat yourself, treat yourself. Um, and that comes from the show, Treat Yourself, which really has more of an Epicurious uh, philosophy of a way of living. Uh, so in this, in this picture, you know, these two uh, characters in the show, Parks and Rec, were, were done with working for that day, and they wanted to instead enjoy the fine aspects of life. Plato was another ancient Greek uh, philosopher and, and scholar. He uh, developed the concept around dualism, which he believed that the soul and our mind is just imprisoned by our own bodies. Um, and Plato described this idea um, with a picture in his mind of a chariot um, where there were two horses and one rider, that the rider was the individual themselves and the horses were emotions, um, two primary emotions, um, like noble emotions like bravery and dangerous emotions like lust. Um, so that the goal in a person's life was to uh, develop uh, techniques so that they can control these emotional ur urges for the betterment of society. And Plato believed that, that those who are happiest are when they are able to be moral and are following um, uh, the four cardinal uh, values, which eventually uh, was the creation of the uh, Stoic foundation, right? Um, those co cardinal values uh, were temperance, fortitude, uh, prudence, and justice. Uh, this uh, particular uh, statue uh, uh, is actually uh, located in the Vatican, which to me demonstrates how influential Plato's philosophies and Stoicism uh, has really shaped um, many uh, beliefs, uh, uh, the, the Protestant uh, or in, in the Catholic uh, faith. Uh, virtuous living was a, um, a real emphasis for many Greek philosophers. Plato had a student, Aristotle, who established the philosophical term eudaimonia, which means, you know, a life of well-being, good fortune, wealth, happiness, that a life well-lived comes from those virtuous behaviors, uh, those, four, those four cardinal uh, virtues. Uh, and so Stoicism really is founded on those virtues, and it really flourished in um, ancient Greek and Rome. So again, if you've heard of someone who, is, who has sort of a Stoic nature, we would call those, those individuals uh, people who have little uh, regard for their emotions. They're doing their best to just stay as centered and not allow emotions to dictate their lives. Um, the goal in their life, in, in a Stoic's life, is to achieve, you know, completely emotionless state, uh, which they, they believed and, uh, w w is that being able to be completely emotionless would bring 
calm and peace in their lives. Uh, just 100, 200 years later, uh, this philosophy around Stoicism was still so strong and true uh, in um, ancient Greek Greece and Rome that the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius showed um, through his own you know, personal journal writings, uh, which was later called Meditations, um, that you know he could um, write as a way to gain uh, greater self-insight and logic and self-improvement. And these writings were really his personal private notes on his interpretation and his understanding uh, of the Stoic philosophy. I also want to mention that during this time, Romans were um, adopting a lot of the Greek beliefs that illness was a product of our diets and our, our lifestyles and that uh, they could begin to build a, an environment that could improve um, the, the health of the public through aqueducts, sewers, um, and you know just public facilities that would in, would emphasize uh, a prevention of disease. So let me pause here and ask: How do these ancient philosophies shape the way you think about health and well-being now? Uh, are you practicing um, what uh, might actually be you know Near Eastern philosophies or? Um, East Asian philosophies or Greek or Roman philosophies around health? Are you being influenced through your own family traditions? Uh, or maybe, you know, how do these ancient philosophies inform what our own culture deems uh, worthy uh, to put attention on? And even more so, how do these ancient philosophies determine what our uh, health system values and doesn't value? Okay, so let's jump ahead uh, a couple thousand years uh, to René Descartes. Uh, many centuries later, French philosopher, scientist, mathematician Descartes, he built on those Stoic principles uh, when he uh, said, I think, therefore I am. He's really credited with continuing that development of the separation between the mind and the body, the rest of the body, that dualism uh, perspective, arguing that um, thinking and rational thoughts exist in a completely different sphere from the physical body. Um, and you can see how his, um, th that dualism um, still is alive and well, even in how we uh, train counseling and psychologists in one area outside of the, the typical medical education space. Um, isn't it fascinating? In the 1790s, German physician Christian Hahnemann uh, developed the philosophy that we would call homeopath homeopathy, um, which would be the philosophy that promotes that there are natural substances that we can use to improve the body's self-healing process. Two of uh, theories that we would call homo homeopathic theories are um, the, the notion called like cures like. Um, it's, a, it's, it's this idea that a disease can be cured by a substance that produces similar symptoms in healthier people. Um, there's also another theory uh, called the law of minimum dose that homeopathics um, consider uh, as a way to dilute, diluting the dose of a, medi of a medication actually creates a greater uh, sense of effectiveness. Um, homeopathic medicine is something that I'll, I would want to make mention. Uh, there is no homeopathic medicine that is approved by federal, uh, the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA. In 1874, Dr. Andrew Taylor Still developed uh, a medical philosophy called osteopathy, uh, and it recognizes that we can treat illness within the context of a whole body. Um, osteopathic medicine still you know, utilizes lab tests um, uh, to be able to diagnose, and they review, uh, you know, a, a physician reviews the, the patient's daily life and their environment and their diet um, and able, as a way to help determine what the most appropriate treatment might be. Um, treatments may also include um, manipulating muscles and joints 
Um, you may see this now, today, uh, that there are physicians that have a DO um, behind their name as a part of their credentials, um, and that's a signal to let you know that they've been trained at a medical school that aligns with the osteopathic philosophy of medicine. The sanatoria health philosophy was, again, developed in the late 1800s as well, um, and it really links health behaviors uh, and overall health with uh, moral righteousness, um, a religious uh, undertoning there um, coming from um, a particular uh, subset um, uh, of a religion uh, denomination called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So in the late 1800s, there were uh, a lot of sanatoriums that were created. This one, a picture um, of one from Battle Creek, Michigan, um, the Battle Creek Sanatorium. Um, these were developed all over the country, uh, and yet they were seen more what we would call maybe um, uh, a trendy health and wellness spa destinations, really that were um, only designed for wealthy um, and prominent individuals, right? Um, but a lot of the therapies that came from this philosophy um, include, you know, expo exposure to light, um, exposure to um, uh, heat, um, cold, um, uh, cold ice baths, um, as well as just open air to um, help to reduce um, uh, tuberculosis, perhaps. Um, uh, there was also therapies that include strength training and calisthenics and posture exercises um, and building a, a, a regimen around your diet and nutrition, um, as well as, um, you know, the origins of really health education itself. Um, you would might be interested, if you didn't know this already, that breakfast cereals uh, have its origin coming from the sanatoria health philosophy. Many of our uh, our, uh, our cereals today, uh, like grape nuts, um, were created by cereal uh, uh, companies, uh, natural health pioneers like um, uh, Kellogg, uh, James Caleb Jackson, um, CW Post. Are you recognizing Post and Kellogg? These are brands that we still know today. And they created these breakfast cereals that were not loaded with sugar. They were actually quite bland. Um, and they saw that as a way to um, aid in helping you digest um, uh, you, you, the food that you've already ate as a way to sort of helping with the, pro the process of digestion. So um, again, the sanatoria health philosophy goes links uh, the behaviors of health with our own um, religious, you know, has righteousness, um, which uh, again, um, you, I want you to take note of that the roots of this were coming from the Seventh Day Adventist Church. You're going to learn about um, another community uh, later on in our course that um, Seventh-day Adventists still to this day are some of the healthiest people um, in, in the United States. The chiropractic medical philosophy was developed in the 1890s um, by Daniel David Palmer, um, and this philosophy suggests that people, when they are in a state of health, they are in a state of ease because their body's natural intelligence um, is expressing itself just as it should, um, and that people are experiencing complete function and harmony. Uh, when people are experiencing dis-ease, they are um, hampered down, their body is, um, is not able to express its natural intelligence because there's something blocking that um, is, inner, is an obstacle so that the, the, the body cannot express its natural intelligence. Um, that idea of, uh, of a body's natural intelligence um, really links chiropractic, uh, this philosophy, to um, the idea of metaphysics in human life. Uh, does li and, and people who are studying, um, who are students in chiropractic colleges, are often asking themselves questions like, does life consist of just physical, chemical processes working together, or is there something more supernatural? Um, I want to also make note that, um, 
you know, a few decades later, in 1963, the American Medical Association formed a committee on quackery, which uh, de was designed, um, had an intent in um, really reducing the influence of the whole chiropractic profession, medical profession. And up until um, the 1980s, uh, many medical uh, physicians who were trained in other schools, uh, which I'll get to you in a second, um, were um, they, they was considered unethical to associate yourself as a physician with anyone who was a part of the chiropractic profession. Christian uh, Samuel Hahnemann, who created the or who coined the term homeopathy, um, also coined the term allopathy which is that idea of usual care, the standard care. Um, so that term allopathy, um, allopathic medical uh, philosophy, um, had really already taken center stage. And in 1910, uh, the John D. Rockefeller and the Andrew Carnegie Foundations, those are two big names in the, in the, the, the culture at the time, uh, and really still to this day, um, they helped Abraham Flexner to publish uh, the Flexner Report. And this report uh, claimed that after extensive studies and reviews, um, Flexner said that the most effective system of medicine was the German approach called, we now call allopathic medicine, that standard of care. So the Flexner Report really transformed the training process of medical education and really result was the, uh, along with many things, it resulted in the closing of so many medical schools in um, homeopathy, in um, osteopathy, in chiropractic uh, medicine, and that it really established this biomedical model as the gold standard for medical education and medical training. So what we call allopathic medicine today is where you are fo the, the healthcare provider focuses on the symptom and diagnoses the disease to treat illnesses with the use of a medication. Um, when we think about physicians who have the credential of an MD um, behind their name, that's a signal that they have been trained at a medical school that aligns with this allopathic medical philosophy. So we've already discussed how ancient civilizations, um, Greek, Roman philosophy, East Asian philosophies have shaped our understanding of well-being and our life's purpose, uh, our goal um, when it comes to um, creating a sense of health. But how do these more modern medical philosophies, how does it influence how you view your healthcare provider? Um, how does it shape the way you see yourself as a patient? Um, in terms of who's the expert of your body and who's the expert of your life. How do these medical philosophies inform even what our culture deems valuable in terms of the health services that are paid for by insurance? And uh, how do the medical philosophies that you've learned determine what our healthcare system is willing to pay for? In 1948, the World Health Organization developed a very powerful definition of health that we still use to this day. That quote, that definition is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. What a statement when you think about how far we've come with all of these interesting well-being philosophies and medical philosophies. Dr. Halbert Dunn, who established the Public Health System's National Vital Statistics System, uh, that's, that's things like our birth certificates, our death certificates, um, he became inspired by that definition that the World Health Organization created in 1948, so much so that he became this guru in well-being, and, and he conducted a, a great number of uh, wellness lectures. He went on a, 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 a circuit around uh, uh, the world, primarily the United States, um, and he's often referred to, uh, as the father of the wellness movement. 
Dr. John Travis was inspired by Dunn and his movement towards the concept of wellness uh, from the 1950s and 60s that he took it a step further and really helped to uh, bring the idea of wellness to the masses. He developed the first wellness center in California. Um, and I want you to take notice of the illness wellness continuum. What you see is that it describes health and illness on two ends of, of a spectrum, two, you know, the opposite ends of a spectrum. Um, and that people can move back and forth within their, within their lifespan. They can move back and forth between illness and wellness. And it really uh, uh, depends on their own um, perception of, of their health status. It depends on the, um, how others perceive their particular health status. Um, I also want you to take note of the wellness paradigm versus the treatment paradigm. What uh, Dr. Travis wanted to convey within the illness wellness continuum was that medical care could only get you so far. It could only get you to a neutral point um, that through treatment, it could only get you out of premature death, um, out of disability, out of the, the feelings, the symptoms that, you, that an individual might be feeling, um, out of that, the signs of, of dis-ease, right? Um, and take you only to a neutral point. But if we think about wellness and our perception of well-being, we can continue to grow into higher levels of well-being and wellness. We can become uh, much more aware and educated and continue to grow um, so that it is uh, possible for us to consider that someone who may have a disability if they are facing a, a wellness paradigm and they're looking towards that higher level of, of wellness, that it's possible for someone to be um, considered in a medical model, a biomedical model, to have a disability, uh, but also experience a wellness uh, growth mindset and, and experience high levels of well-being even when they are in a state of disability. In the 1970s, Dr. Bill Hetler developed uh, what we now call the wellness wheel. This is something that um, is often um, a, a way to describe um, so many aspects of what health and well being can be. Um, you may have seen this when you were in health classes in high school uh, that our our people can be healthier and more content with their lives if they are able to improve the, the balance that exists between all of these aspects of, of, of what enriches their life. Um, the, the wellness wheel is something that uh, has, shows all kind of dimensions of health and well-being, spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, occupational, intellectual, environmental, um, financial wellness, social uh, relationships, that physical health. Um, so it really uh, creates an understanding of there's an interconnectedness of each of these dimensions. So I could have ended our lecture video with Dr. Hetler's uh, wellness wheel and Dr. Travis's illness wellness continuum, but I had to include this. Uh, in 1979, the term wellness began to become even more well known uh, when CBS's 60 Minutes uh, had an on-air you know, an investigative uh, reporter named Dan Rather investigate this movement uh, called wellness. And my apologies for the expressions that I have on my face because I want you to watch a sample of this um, investigative journalism, um, which really shows you um, where people were in their understanding of this philosophy at the time. What do you notice? I want you to, to watch this video. What do you notice about the perception of understanding of wellness and self-care in this video? So all this to be said. Philosophical beliefs continue to shape our lives. Um, barriers still remain within an individual's beliefs um, that 
may limit them and it may undermine their own understanding of their health and how far they could come when it comes to their health and well-being. But there are also barriers that are within an institutional's, you know, a rigid system that could undermine a population's health. So when we're trying to help people change their health behaviors, we have to recognize that there are some deep-seated philosophies that we have within our minds about what it means to be healthy and whole and well. Thanks so much for joining me. This is the lecture video on the philosophical origins of health and well-being.